Okay, it's lovely to see so many of you here. Welcome to St Mary Le Beau and one of our Just Share Check uh, lectures. Uh, my name is Nina and I've been invited to uh, introduce today's lecture because I'm a member of the Diocese of London Fair Trade Steering Group. Um, and we've got a wonderful event on at St Paul's in a couple of weeks because we've just achieved fair trade status. But I also feel that I could stand here because I'm a trade crafter and I started off a fair trade stall at my church many years ago. And uh, that was very often the way that we all got involved with fair trade, was selling tea and coffee in the days when you couldn't actually buy very much fair trade in the supermarket. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Paul Chandler, who's Chief Executive of Tradecraft. And um, I'm sure you'll have a very interesting lecture, and I'm sure you'll have lots of interesting questions um, to ask him at the end. So uh, we'll just wait for a couple of people to take their seats. Welcome. And I'll hand over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, and uh, it's very good to, to, to be here again, St Mary LeBeau. Um, Usually when I'm making presentations, I'm doing it with PowerPoint slides and, and really giving lots of producer stories and illustrations and, uh, and pictures. Uh, I'm afraid if that's what you've come expecting tonight, you're going to be sadly disappointed. This is a more reflective lecture. Um, and as, as you know, I'm particularly going to be reflecting on fair trade and Christian attitudes and Christian thought relating to the market economy and trying to link up what... Uh, influences that have been from the Christian church on the development of, of fair trade. It's about this time of year it's become traditional for a free market think tank to produce a report critical of fair trade. Timed to ride on the back of the publicity around fair trade fortnight, these reports often try to challenge the effectiveness of fair trade systems, often even claiming that fair trade does more harm than good. And their arguments, I think, reflect a, a fairly deep-held belief that because economic theory suggests that completely free markets are the best way of maximising wealth creation, then anything which interferes with the untrammeled working of that market must inherently be seen as a bad or damaging thing. Uh, I think one of the more thoughtful critics from this school of thought has been Professor Philip Booth of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And from time to time, Philip will venture to into the church media to complain that so many Christians seem to assume that fair trade is the only moral response to the problems of trade and poverty. And as a practising Roman Catholic himself, he clearly feels passionately that the virtues of the free market should be given more airtime and more support from the pulpit. And if you cross the Atlantic Ocean, you can find many Christian free market think tanks who would support that view, the Acton Institute or the Poverty Cure Initiative, just two examples. And they argue, too, that just free markets and very limited government intervention is the way to maximise wealth, and therefore that will automatically allow poor people to rise out of poverty. Now, there are, of course, many good economic counter-arguments to, to this strand of, of thinking, uh, but I suspect many of those will be familiar to people here tonight. You'll have heard them expressed time and again. Uh, so I don't propose, you may be relieved to hear, to run through them all now, although I'll be very happy to uh, talk about them during questions if you want to afterwards. But my purpose, as I've already said this evening, is really to explore how fair trade connects with various traditions of Christian thinking about the working of the marketplace and the, the way to respond to poverty. And I'm going to try and do this in the context of exploring the evolution of fair trade thinking and practice over the past 60 years and reflect on how different emphases have emerged during the development of the fair trade movement. But I did want to start by referring to those economic debates, just as a way of acknowledging at the outset that support for fair trade isn't the only possible position for Christians to hold. The examples I've quoted amply demonstrate that dedicated, committed Christians can, with integrity, hold different positions on that issue. Nevertheless, I am going to suggest that the values that have underpinned and motivated the development of fair trade over the years do reflect important dimensions of a specifically Christian worldview. And this in itself makes it much less than makes it not surprising that the fair trade movement has attracted so much intuitive and indeed passionate support right across the Christian community in this country and in many other parts of the world. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to also set out some aspects of current Christian thinking 
that I hope and believe could influence the next stages in the development of fair trade. At this point, I should probably make two disclaimers. Firstly, when I'm talking about the, the theological arguments and background here, I am not a professional theologian, nor am I an academic. So I don't claim a, a great depth of expertise in discussing the philosophical and theological bases of some of the viewpoints I'm going to put forward. But I think I do have a, an educated layperson's understanding uh, sufficient to help us grasp the essentials. And secondly, of course, I am unashamedly a practitioner and an advocate of fair trade and international development. And that emphasis on fair trade as a development tool, rather than just a system of ethical practice, undoubtedly is going to colour the way that I look at things and the arguments that I'm going to put forward. And also should make it clear from the start that when I talk about fair trade, I'm not just talking about the fair trade labelling system and the fair trade mark as used by all the new corporate entrants into the market. Cadbury's, Nestle's, Mars, Tesco's, Sainsbury's, the list gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger companies involved. And I welcome the fact, and Tradecraft uh, has long worked for, these big companies to move into fair trade. It's exactly why we were one of the founders of the Fair Trade Foundation. We wanted to encourage this sort of engagement and involvement of the big multinationals. We're going to need their muscle and expertise to give market access to millions more disadvantaged producers around the world. But, in my view, there are limitations inherent in any system of labelled fair trade, of certification of fair trade. And that means that fair trade, as practised by these big companies, won't always deliver the fullness of approach that I believe Tradecraft and other dedicated fair trade organisations seeks to implement. So when I'm talking about what fair trade does and its values and its ethos, I may need to be talking not so much about the fair trade mark as the approach that's adopted by the dedicated fair trade organisations like Tradecraft here in the UK, but we could point to GAPA, our equivalent number in Germany, to EZA in Austria, to Claro in Switzerland, or 10,000 Villages and Serve in the USA. These organisations are all amongst the early pioneers of fair trade in their own countries, and they all remain amongst the largest fair trade organisations. Now, even within this group, there's obviously a spectrum of principles and practices. We don't agree on everything. Some of us are much more inclined to encourage mainstream companies to come into fair trade, and others think that may be a big mistake. Some of us are very wedded to the cooperative model as a non-negotiable structure within fair trade. Others are more at ease with a variety of different entrepreneurial structures. So when in doubt, I'll, of course, first and foremost, be thinking about the approach adopted by Tradecraft, because that's the one that I know and love the best. But it's no accident that all of those organisations I've just listed, the Gapers, Claros, Tradecrafts of the world, were set up and are still owned by Christian churches and predominantly by Christian individuals. It's often not fully appreciated that the origins of the fair trade movement stem very much from the Christian community. I can't claim that the movement was exclusively Christian. Oxfam in this country, for example, has been involved from a very early stage. But as I'll be explaining, Christian organisations and Christian thinking have always been at the forefront of fair trade and have had a great influence on its development. If we go back to the very beginning, the first organisation to work in a way that I think is recognisably consistent with fair trade principles was 10,000 Villages in the United States. It celebrated its 65th birthday last year, so it's really the senior citizen uh, of the movement. 10,000 Villages is a Mennonite initiative, and it imports craft products from around the world, selling them through a chain of 100 or so uh, retail fair trade shops. And their model of fair trade has always been essentially an exercise in Christian compassion. They seek to serve the needs of the poor and the marginalised. And that calling is clearly rooted in a biblical mandate that stretches across Old and New Testaments, and that I'm sure lies at the heart of the motivation of many Christian supporters of fair trade. It's very hard to read the Bible and not be struck by the consistency of its message about God's heart for the poor. Some of you may have seen a couple of years ago, the Bible Society brought out an edition of the Bible, in which they highlighted in sort of orange marker pen all those passages and verses which they thought related to justice and poverty issues. You could open almost any page and you'd find yourself facing a glare of bright orange. Because throughout the Old Testament, <coughs> you will find repeated references to the importance of treating widows and orphans and strangers well. 
We'll find the principles of Jubilee and Leviticus and prophetic warnings against exploitation of the poor from prophets like Micah and Amos. And the New Testament adds even more weight to the centrality of serving the poor. Thinks of Jesus' own teaching about the sheep and the goats. And whenever you feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, you do this for me. And indeed, his own summary of his mission right at the outset of, of his work was bringing good news to the poor. When that's combined with warnings such as that in the letter of James about the consequences of exploiting labourers, and if you read James chapter 5, uh, there's a pretty hard-hitting sort of message, woe to you rich oppressors, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Well, it's not surprising that Christians, taking all of this into account, have always taken seriously the command to show compassion to those in need. Interestingly, 10,000 Villages to this day limits its work to reaching out to the craft producers with whom they trade. They've consciously rejected any extension of their remit to tackling, tackling deeper structural problems about the way that markets work. So, unlike a trade craft, 10,000 Villages doesn't undertake political advocacy work. It's not lobbying for or against big company practices, nor is it challenging unjust trade rules. Its focus is very clear and simple building direct relationships between compassionate Christian communities in the USA and impoverished producers in the global south. So the very origins of fair trade can be seen to be directly rooted as a response to the Christian call to serve the needs of the poor. But the European model of fair trade has from the start been somewhat more radical in its nature and in its intent compared to the 10,000 villages approach but it's equally rooted in Christian motivation. I've been talking uh, to some of the original founders of fair trade uh, here in Europe, and uh, they're very clear that the person who, who's regarded as the, the inspired individual from whom it's all stemmed uh, was a, ma a man called Paul Mace, who was a radical Dutch Catholic. And in the 1950s, he developed a real passionate feeling that producers working in poverty needed to be treated with greater justice. And he, I think, came from a, a very left-wing background, and he f combined that with a desire to challenge the capitalist trading system and the consequences uh, of capitalism as he saw it. So Paul May set up a group, and they collected money and set up craft workshops. And these were often linked to Catholic mission projects uh, in Haiti, in the Philippines, and elsewhere. And as they began to grow in scale, they linked up with some German Christian agencies, particularly Misereo and Bread for the World. But after a while, they realised that just raising money to provide tools and skills and workshops wasn't actually going to have the impact on poverty that they wanted. They needed to be, provide producers with access to markets in which they could sell products if that loop was going to be closed. And so in 1959, Paul Mace set up SOS, the first European fair trade organisation. And this continues to this day, uh, working in the Netherlands, but now under the name of Fair Trade Original. SOS acted as a catalyst to establish sister fair trade organisations in Germany, in Austria and in Switzerland. It had quite a remarkable sort of domino effect in setting up fair trade around the continent. All of them initially focused on importing crafts and selling their goods through a growing network of fair trade world shops, as they're often called on the continent, largely manned by volunteers. And to this day, there's over 3,000 such shops active uh, in different European countries. But in 1973, SOS created another major first by deciding to work in food as well as handicrafts. And the first product was coffee from Guatemala and Nicaragua and some other Central American countries, all countries involved at that time in Cold War political struggles. And coffee from Latin America soon became, perhaps arguably remains, the iconic fair trade product. This was the era in which Tradecraft also began importing campaign coffee from Latin America. Some of you will remember it. Arguably quite undrinkable, but it did make you feel real solidarity and empathy with the poor. But this growing focus on working in Latin America through these Christian pioneer European organisations gave, I think, fair trade a natural connection uh, with liberation theology, which at that time, as you'll know, was a very powerful stream of thinking uh, within the region. Liberation theology is developed by Gustavo Gutierrez, I think he's probably the leading uh, best-known writer, but many others too, they reinforce themes of justice and solidarity as central to the Christian gospel. And they went further than just a message of compassion. 
to argue for the rights of individuals to be treated with dignity. They advocated much more equitable distribution of property and advocated a preferential option for the poor. And the close involvement of fair trade with a network of radical Catholic priests in Latin America, I believe also reinforced the early focus on working with small scale producer groups as a key methodology within fair trade. And it brought in a new appreciation of cooperative organisational structures, because these mirror in many ways the development of base communities within the Latin American church at this time of liberation theology. This stress on organising producers into communities, into groups, where ordinary workers could be empowered and where the groups could be treated more as partners rather than as the recipients of goodwill and charitable handouts, those have remained really important themes in fair trade. Now, this vision is to some degree now being diluted by the fair trade certified practices of larger companies, because many of them are sourcing from larger scale estates and plantations in ways that should have been quite alien to the fair trade pioneers of the 1970s. But that original uh, basis of fair trade lives on very explicitly in things such as the requirement for certified fair trade producers to have worker committees that will decide how premium payments can be used to benefit the wider community. And the theme of worker empowerment continues to be referred to frequently by fair trade advocates. And if you look at the pioneer organisations, the trade crafts, capers, fair trade originals of this world, we all still focus on helping smallholders and smaller scale producer organisations. And that commitment, I think, dates back to this early engagement with Latin America. In those early decades of fair trade, many of, of uh, the movement's leaders were consciously rejecting capitalist models. They saw those as a continuation of colonialism and of exploitation. They talked of solidarity economics, and indeed the whole movement termed itself alternative trade, not fair trade, that's a much more recent uh, terminology. Alternative trade to stress its differentiation from mainstream practices. And the pioneers of the 60s and 70s we weren't so much seeking as we do today to improve the way global, mar global market systems work. or to s They were rather trying to subvert capitalism and big business, to set up a parallel, distinct market where people of principle and goodwill could trade with each other on equal terms but untainted by big business and capitalism. And I wonder whether in this suspicion of capitalist models and the promotion of small egalitarian and predominantly rural communities, the early fair traders may also have been drawing, perhaps subconsciously, on older, more radical Christian traditions. One can think of the proto-communism of the very early church in Acts 3, or the traditions of Anabaptist and other radical movements, maybe the Civil War period diggers here in, the, in England, who rejected social structures based on wealth and property. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? This distrust of the forces of mammon and of the profit motive in general, still runs deep in many church circles. I think many church leaders are instinctively suspicious of business. And although there are signs in the last couple of decades of a, a greater understanding of how markets work, profits still often readily assumed to be based on exploitation, rather than understood as a potential benefit of wealth creation or a reward for innovation. And the visions of a rural utopian ideal, set in contrast to industrial capitalism, may also have drawn on the thinking of 19th century Christian socialists, such as Ruskin. Ruskin eulogised the virtues of the honest, small-scale artisan, the dignity of craftsmanship, the importance of rural communities and cooperative structures, and argued against seeing humans simply as economic units. All of these strands of thoughts, I think, resonate clearly with fair trade visions of how rural communities and small producer groups can prosper and flourish. But as we move into the 1980s, we can see the start of a significant shift in the way the fair trade movement has been working. As fair trade began to emerge from the niche of the world shops and the church uh, stalls, and began to engage more directly with mainstream markets. And the key tool in this process was clearly the advent of fair trade labeling and certification systems. Now the clear motivation between the move to labelling was a feeling of frustration at the slow rate of expansion of fair trade, and therefore the limited impact it was having in being able to raise more than just a lucky few fair trade producers from poverty. 
Unless fair trade could be extended to penetrate wider markets, it was recognised that the benefits would be limited to thousands of families rather than addressing the problems of global poverty and the millions of producers. But to achieve a bigger impact, it was obvious that fair trade importers would have to start selling into mainstream retailers. And labelling was initially seen as the most practical way of convincing high street shops and general consumers of the ethical credentials of goods being sold by the trade crafts and gapers of this world uh, uh, through other new channels. But again, the origins of labelling uh, are ones in which we can see Christian influences very distinctly at work. It was actually an idea thought up and driven by a Dutch priest, Franz van der Hoff, who was based in Mexico and who spent most of his ministry working alongside smallholder coffee producers. And Franz managed to persuade another Christian called Nico Rosen from a Dutch ecumenical development agency, although I think they've secularised themselves since, but called Solidaridad. And Franz and Nico together funded and developed a labelling system which they launched in 1988 using the brand name of Max Havilar. That's uh, after a 19th century novel critical of Dutch colonialism in the East Indies. Again, that radical dimension coming through in the very branding they, they adopted. And the Max Havilar label initially focused on coffee, but gradually began to extend to other areas. And that idea from Holland began to be replicated in other countries. And here in the UK, a group of development agencies, Christian Aid, CAFOD, Oxfam, the World Development Movement, Women's Institute and Tradecraft, four of those organisations being explicitly Christian, founded the Fair Trade Foundation in 1992. The establishment of the foundation was, over the following decade, to lead to a significant shift in the driving force and momentum behind fair trade from the Netherlands, which is always seen as the, uh, the homeland, to the UK, which today is seen as the biggest and most vibrant market in the world. And because with the, it was with the support, particularly of Oxfam and Tradecraft, and our supporters, that in Britain more than anywhere else, it was realised that labelling could go beyond just helping to sell the pioneer organisation's own goods in mainstream retailers, but could actually be a tool to allow bigger companies to start doing their own fair trade supply chains with some credibility. So the fair trade mark in the UK became not just a way of selling Cafe Direct and Tradecraft Geobars in supermarkets, but of getting Green and Blacks, Cadbury's, Nestle, Tate and Lyle and the supermarket own labels to come in too. And as a result, by 2005, the UK having been regarded as a backwater in fair trade, well behind the, continent, the continental European uh, sort of advocates of fair trade, by 2005, we were the largest and fastest growing market for fair trade. But I'm running a little bit ahead of myself there, and before considering the implications of that mainstreaming, which I think are quite significant, just want to note that in 1997, the various national labelling initiatives that were established around Europe copying the Max Havilar model were all brought together into the Fair Trade Labelling Organisation, usually known as FLO, and FLO is still uh, today the principal standard setter and auditing authority within the world of fair trade. As you will I'm sure, all know, the FLO system has developed a set of consistent international fair trade standards for key product areas like cocoa, coffee, sugar, bananas. And each of those commodities has a set of standards covering a range of issues relating to particular problems in agricultural practices for those commodities, but also requiring structures for worker participation, health and safety standards, equal treatment of men and women, uh, and so forth. But perhaps the, the best understood and best known aspect of fair trade certification has been the concept of a minimum fair trade price. The minimum price to be paid to an agricultural producer, which is supposedly sufficient to cover the cost of production and provide a reasonable level of profit. This concept of the fair or minimum price is one that at first sight resonates with the concept of the just price in Thomas Aquinas's and other scholastic theologians thinking back in the 13th century. And the linkage between the concepts of fair price and just price is one that I find quite often referred to uh, in church circles. And actually, in the context of this lecture, it'd be tempting to claim it as another parallel or another source of inspiration. Um, but although I'm not an expert in scholastic theology, anything but, from what I've read of it, my understanding is that actually the scholastic theologians were tackling a slightly different set of issues to those that fair trade is focused on. Whereas fair trade focuses on the price paid at the farm gate, 
and therefore the earnings of the agricultural producer, or indeed the crafts producer. Aquinas' arguments focus on how much profit is ethical for a trader to get from selling on a product he's acquired. So they're looking at different stages in the supply chain. Aquinas is arguing about the final selling price of a product and saying that it should only be increased if the merchant has really added value and so that the merchant can have an adequate standard of living for themselves. Aquinas doesn't consider any depth issues relating to the cost of production of an item and insofar as he makes any statements about the right value of a product, he's mostly referring just to supply and demand and a commonly determined market price. So Aquinas' theories are at heart a critique of the making of exorbitant profits and of merchants exploiting buyers' particular circumstances to their own advantage. Some echoes there of cutting out the middleman, perhaps. But whilst most fair trade advocates would have a great deal of sympathy with this and would probably align themselves with such principles, actually the fair trade certification system has nothing to say about the final selling price of a product. Indeed, we've now been seeing over the last five or six years supermarkets competing with price on fair trade categories. It's not about what you sell it for, it's about the price you paid for the ingredients in the first place. This process of supermarket competition is bringing fair trade prices and margins down, which is beneficial and making it, them accessible to a wider range of consumers, although it does pose significant challenges to organisations like Tradecraft, who are now struggling to compete against the economies of scale of some of the, the commercial giants who've entered fair trade. But we can see that whilst fair trade focuses on the return to the producer, just price is more about the ethical level of return to be enjoyed by the trader. We might think that we should take to heart some of these principles of just price in some of the campaigning around supermarkets and the like that we undertake. But the linkage with the formal fair trade system is perhaps sadly not as strong as it might appear at first sight. But let me return to, developing, to the tracing the development of fair trade over time. Uh, as a consequence of the introduction of labelling, Fair trade has been able to grow remarkably in mainstream markets. Uh, you've probably heard the Fair Trade Foundation's announcements uh, this week for Fair Trade Fortnight that in 2011, UK consumers bought over £1.3 billion worth of fair trade marked products. And that's a 12% increase on 2010, despite the recession. It's a really uh, impressive achievement. Today, big brands and retailers in the UK can almost not afford, can't afford not to be involved. Because in some categories like ground coffee, cocoa, bag sugar, bananas, fair trade now accounts for a remarkable 35% or more market share of those commodities in the UK. That's a real critical mass that's been achieved. It's a remarkable success story, and it does mean that the volume of sales that fair trade producers can make is growing to highest uh, ever levels. And worldwide, uh, the foundation would now estimate there's one and a half million producers, plus their families, who are benefiting from fair trade supply chains. However, as fair trade players begin to engage at this new level of sort of uh, big business, I think we need to develop a more nuanced and sophisticated understanding of large businesses and of market forces. As we get involved with the Nestle's and the Marses and the crafts of this world, we have to recognize that although not all their actions in the market are benign, we can't simply dismiss big companies as universally exploitative and damaging. However much that goes back to the roots of, of the radicalism of the 1970s, um, the simple anti-corporate slogans of the past no longer hold water as their oversimplifications. And indeed, I think we have to recognise that the transfer of investment resources and technical expertise that can come with a big company getting involved in fair trade can be really beneficial to producers and can go further in many ways um, than a tradecraft can, can do in terms of the resources they have that they can bring to their supply chains. So we do need to recognise more fully the potential for good that lies within the trading relationships of the large players. But we still must retain a healthy realism about the potential they have too to cause damage just through the sheer scale of their buying power and by poor practices and by setting the wrong targets for their staff and their suppliers who might then be tempted to turn the screw on producers. And we must always be very aware, of course, that the motivation of this type of company is driven by the bottom line rather than primarily by a desire for a beneficial social impact. It's what one might expect. They're, after all, they're businesses. They're not development agencies or charities. But we do need constantly to remember 
that large corporate commitment to development is driven largely by consumer pressure. And if the general public ceases to uh, place pressure on them to supply that sort of good, then I believe we would rapidly see fair trade ranges begin to diminish again. Nevertheless, the advent of large-scale fair trade licensees into the system is opening up new opportunities for impact at scale, and we need to welcome and embrace that and find ways of working around it. Because having acknowledged these positives, we've got to now tackle some of the dangers that are emerging within the system. Some of these are beginning to cause me increasing concern. Because the entry of these big players and the way that a, a more rigid certification system are beginning to work can end up excluding small-scale producers from access to fair trade markets. For example, if a big company is trying to be audited for fair trade, they will get a fair trade auditor who will come, do an inspection, charge them $1,000. It costs just as much for a small producer to get certified. It takes as much time for, for them to be certified by the auditor. The volumes they're going to sell are very much smaller, so proportionately it's a much bigger cost to them. And because small producers are less able to keep good documentation systems than a professional manager on a large estate, they're more likely to come up with non-compliances and require a second audit to follow through, further making it disadvantageous to them. The, just the very working of a system, which you can understand why it tries to be rigid, uh, uh, can exclude some of the very people it's designed to help. And if we're not careful, the original vision and purposes of fair trade could be subverted. Fair trade could become merely an ethical standard which guarantees that certain criteria are met, but which has lost its developmental and poverty-fighting cutting edge. Now, all of this is subject, is subject worthy of a separate lecture in its own right, um, but we may want to talk about it more uh, in questions afterwards. But in the context of tonight's talk, I just want to suggest that in responding to some of these challenges and to the new world of mainstream fair trade, we perhaps need to draw new vigour and energy from another strand of Christian thinking. Building on a long tradition of social teaching within the Catholic Church, John Paul II, in his encyclical Centesimus Annus, if that's the right pronunciation, and then Pope Benedict in 2009, his encyclical Caritas in Veritate, they've set out some extremely useful and strong principles on the operation of the marketplace, which I believe resonate very strongly with some of the deeper values and principles of fair trade. These encyclicals argue that whilst private property, markets and businesses are valuable, we must beware of idolising the market. And markets must always be seen as subordinate to the common good. There's a realistic appraisal in the encyclicals of the limitations of the free market and of the dangers of giving an undue weighting to economic efficiency in delivering human well-being. As Pope Benedict stated, markets are made for man, not man for markets. Every economic decision should be seen as having a moral consequence. And, the church argues, intervention may be needed to make sure that markets aren't a place where the strong subdue the weak. So excessive disparities of wealth must be questioned, God's creation must be safeguarded, and businesses should be held accountable to all their stakeholders, whether through wider share ownership, promotion of trade unions, or the payment of living wages for workers. This Catholic teaching places stress on the importance of human dignity, the fact that all people are made in the image of God, and that as individuals, everyone is called to respond to situations of injustice and to be active in their own lives in promoting the common good, in their economic lives, as well as their other interactions with communities. Now, all of this teaching sounds very familiar and very welcome to those of us who've been promoting fair trade principles over recent decades. I think it indicates a high degree of alignment, again, between fair trade thinking and Christian thought. Indeed, at times, Caritas and Veritate reads like a manifesto for social enterprises and for fair trade, and it most certainly constitutes a direct challenge to the neoliberal free market approach. Philip Booth might want Catholic churches to preach the virtue of the free market, but the Pope would have some qualms about doing that in a simplistic way. And perhaps this teaching has relevance to us as we begin to engage more with these powerful multinationals who dominate so much uh, of trade. And this reminds us that actually in this process, we've got to be very careful not to compromise our core values, our core purposes, that commitment to the common good and the needs of the weak, as well as the benefits of the strong. <clears throat> 
So far, I've tracked the development of Christian thinking in fair trade from the primary motivation of compassion for the poor through the adoption of themes of justice and solidarity and the radicalism of that Latin American moment, and now engagement with the challenges of dealing with the principalities and powers of the mainstream market. I suspect that part of the strength of fair trade, uh, of the support for fair trade in Christian circles, is that it can connect at a deep level with so many of these different strands of Christian teaching and thinking. And that allows individual supporters in churches to find different sources of spiritual and theological inspiration and justification that can really motivate them and sustain them in their passion for fair trade. But where do we go next? As Christians engaged in fair trade, can we align our practices and our faith even more closely? Over the past couple of years, Tradecraft's been trying to reflect quite a lot on this, particularly as we try to articulate what distinguishes us as a Christian, faith-based, fair trade pioneer from the dominant mainstream companies with whom we're now competing. And in this process of reflection, we've drawn particularly upon one aspect of Tradecraft's vision statement. Our vision reads as follows. A world freed from the scandal of poverty, where trade is just and people and communities can flourish. Now, you might have noticed the statement doesn't actually contain the word fair at all. Instead, we stress the themes of justice and flourishing, which we believe are much richer and more challenging concepts. And it's on that final phrase, so that people and communities can flourish, that we now believe we need to place even more emphasis as an outworking of our Christian basis. There are three particular dimensions of flourishing that Tradecraft is going to try to take more seriously as we evolve over this coming 10-year period. Firstly, we recognise more clearly that fair trade benefits shouldn't focus exclusively on providing financial and material improvements for producers. Those are, of course, essential. If you're very poor, you need material improvement to overcome the very sort of basic problems that you're facing. But a Christian vision of fair trade must, we believe, place equally strong emphasis on other dimensions that are more about treating people with dignity, promoting feelings of self-worth, promoting opportunity and hope. We need to underline the importance of the quality of relationships and recognise that human beings have spiritual dimensions and needs as well as material needs. Now, these have always been important aspects of what we actually do. And if you read the stories we tell about Tradecraft's impact on producers, it's often these softer factors that tend to come to the fore in what we say. But in the way we run ourselves, they've almost been incidental. We've measured the economic, material, money aspects uh, of our impact. And we believe that now, if we're going to take the concept of flourishing seriously, we need to find new ways of measuring that well-being. And we're beginning to make exciting progress in, in this. We're working with a team from the University of Bath to develop a, a very practical and cost-effective mechanism for evaluating how people feel about themselves, which we can take alongside more quantitative and material measures of our impact. And we hope that that's going to help us learn how to implement our Christian vision much more effectively as we move forward. Secondly, we recognise that human flourishing can't be, seen out, can't be seen outside the context of the created environment. If people are going to flourish, we're going to have to be better stewards of the planet. Tradecraft, of course, has been long active in promoting environmental responsibility, both uh, amongst producers and in our supply chains in general. And in recent years, we've been working even harder to develop local as well as international markets for fair trade, and helping producers diversify and adapt agricultural approaches to cope with the very real impact of climate change on their environments. But I believe that if we're going to take this area really seriously, we're going to need to reflect more on how tradecraft and fair trade need to recognise the natural limits to economic growth. We can't hope to overcome poverty simply by growing the global economy, overcome poverty by growing the global economy, if in the process we damage the earth and deplete its resources unsustainably. I think this is perhaps the most important challenge of all to the free market growth paradigm as, a, a, the, as an effective route of tackling global poverty. But what does it mean for fair trade if we need to argue increasingly for the need to limit levels of consumption and promote truly responsible consumerism? How can we combine that with running an organisation that by its nature needs to sell things in order to survive? There are challenges and paradoxes that I think we're going to have to start to face. Thirdly, 
Draycroft recognises that flourishing is something that we need to promote for the northern hemisphere consumer as well as for the producer in the developing world. One of the benefits of fair trade is that it helps people understand more about the origins of the products they consume. They can see the producers behind the products. They feel a greater sense of connectedness across the globalised world. And I believe that fair trade through these means can help consumers achieve a greater sense of, of personal well-being as they align their own purchasing decisions with their moral principles, as they consume less and feel they're being a responsible global citizen. And feeling that they're now participants in a more holistic system of trade that can challenge the worldview that happiness is only achieved by more material consumption. Now, as Traycraft's been developing these lines of thoughts to steer our own mission and our own plans for the future, we've been very interested in a parallel piece of work carried out by uh, CAFOD, Tier Fund, uh, and the Theos uh, Think Tank. And it's the publication of this, this little booklet, which I highly commend to you, called Holy Living. Very short, but, but well worth uh, an hour or two to read it. And this booklet focuses on what truly constitutes human flourishing in the context of international development. And I just want to touch very briefly on a couple of its conclusions as they relate to the arena of trade. Firstly, Holy Living argues that if humans are made in God's image, then we must all share in God's essence as a creator. And God's nature as, as a creator underlines the importance of work for human beings. Work is a key outlet for our God-given creativity and a vital source of dignity and satisfaction. Secondly, Holy Living argues that if we subscribe to a Trinitarian model of the nature of God, then relationships must be seen as being at the heart of what it means to be truly human, as we reflect the eternal dynamic relationships between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so the creation of strong, long-lasting, mutually beneficial relationships as a key aspect of fair trade, whether that's between producer organisations and importers, or between fair trade consumers and those behind the products they buy, that becomes a really central dimension of what we're about. And thirdly, the Theos report brings out an interesting stress on the importance of generosity as a key dimension of human flourishing. And again, in a fair trade context, this can be seen as relating not just to providing people in poverty with a capacity to be generous, and I have to say producer groups always are hugely generous when you visit them, but it's also by helping Norman cons consumers to flourish by being able to act justly and generously through their support for fair trade. They can equally have that greater sense of connectedness between their faith and their daily lives. So I find it exciting that whether in this think tank or in the papal teaching we've been talking about, we can again see convergence between contemporary Christian thinking on what it is to be human and emerging priorities for fair trade and wider economic and business practices. And as we move out of this recession, hopefully, I think our society is having to ask ourselves new questions about how we're organised economically. And the debate's been stirred up by the Occupy movement a few hundred yards away from here. I think they've moved, haven't they, to Finsbury Square or something from St Paul's now. But those are very highly pertinent debates. Do we want to live in a society and an economy that's based on the rule of untrammeled free markets, on the axiom of continuous growth, of consumption and materialism as a way of tackling all evils? Or should we instead, as Christians, be seeking to promote a way of life that builds more on the sort of values which have long been embodied in fair trade, relationships, responsible consumption, generosity, stewardship of creation, building community, and above all, treating people with justice and respect. These are all values that fair trade has drawn, I think, explicitly from Christian thinking and traditions and from the Christian motivation of its founders and many of its key leaders. And I actually believe these values offer an exciting vision for the future of society. In the 1940s, the Christian thinking that lay behind the Temple Report played a really influential part in the creation of the modern welfare state. So how far can we seize the values implicit within the instinctive and widespread public support for fair trade? And we know that 80% of the general public think fair trade is a good thing in a vague way. How can we use that instinctive support to remodel society and economy and recognise better the human costs and ecological unsustainability of current approaches? Sometimes people in churches say to me they believe the work of the Christian community in supporting fair trade is now over. Having got fair trade into the mainstream, they say, the job is done, we can close down our stalls 
and Christians can turn their attention to other new causes. You won't be surprised to hear that I believe that's a profoundly wrong point of view. Now's not the time to be closing down our fair trade stalls, but maybe we need to use them differently as part of staking out new ground in advocating different economic models and focusing really on how those can lead to human flourishing, not just to the creation of money. We shouldn't simply, as Christians, be patting ourselves on the back for having started something good. And I do think fair trade has been one of the most significant (coughs) ways in which the Christian community has directly impacted on society in this country in recent decades. That's great. But now we must surely not allow fair trade to entirely become a secular initiative. It's much more exciting, I believe, to consider how we can infuse our values again into the next stage of the story. So let us work to build a vision of how fair trade can go forward in in new ways as a means of putting Christian beliefs into practice, that we can bring through it prophetic challenges to the way the world works and promote kingdom values in the marketplace. Thank you, Paul. Um, Fair fair trade as a whole is no longer dependent on the churches. Tradecraft, Café Direct, Divine Chocolate are much more so. Uh, We find it more and more difficult to get our products onto the shelves in supermarkets against those with bigger clout, the Nestle's and Cadbury's uh, of this world. And so if we don't have access to consumers in churches uh, or Christians who are going to buy directly from us through mail order or, or whatever, then our ability to carry on running supply chains for our smaller scale producers will be significantly eroded. So the fair trade mark system doesn't need us. The small scale producers, I think, will. And I mentioned one of the ways in which certification can exclude those small-scale producers. But if you're Cadbury's, you want to buy from a smaller number of suppliers. So you go to the estates and the plantations. And I think one of the tricks that the uh, flow system has missed is not requiring a quota uh, proportion of of big companies' products to be sourced from small-scale producers. So there's a developmental edge. You couldn't say it all has to come from small-scale, but you could say 10 or 20% should come from, from new producers. But given that the system has been set up now in a way that doesn't militate in favour of the small, that's where church people's support is really important. And if we're going to be able to sustain the prophetic activities and thinking and the innovation that a tradecraft is trying to bring as a Christian organisation in this uh, environment, without our Christian supporter base, uh, we we wouldn't exist. I mean, just to be clear, we sell about uh, £15 million of sales uh, a year directly, Of that, three or four million is going through wholesale and mainstream markets. The rest is going through churches or direct to our mail order customers. And we know that even the mail order customers, 85% would consider themselves to be regular practicing Christians. So we are very dependent upon that group for our particular market. And we will go out of existence if that fades away. And then the fair trade market, I, I believe, would lose our catalyst, our challenge, and some of our pioneering work. So... I think church got a role supporting Tradecraft and other Christian organisations in this area, but we're probably the, the biggest uh, of that bunch. Yeah, and things have gone through, the message is changing. 15 years ago, we were indeed saying, go and buy stuff in supermarkets, because at that point, we needed to mobilise Christian consumers to show the supermarkets there's a significant demand out here. And that was absolutely fundamental uh, in, in getting the, uh, the, the massive expansion of fair trade that we've seen going. But now that it's happened, those companies have worked out, oh, there are a lot of consumers out there who like fair trade, and we can make money out of doing this. So there's a business case for it as well. And it's good for our brands uh, and, and our ethical credentials. So they're going to carry on doing it, whatever. So now the challenge is, is back to saying, OK, we've pushed it so far, but now we're at a point where some of the smaller organisations and the smaller producer groups are threatened. And so we've got to come back into the churches to keep that bit of fair trade going. And it's not saying that the mainstream is wrong, because to impact on scale, we need it. But, but there's actually a different quality of fair trade. And actually, we need people like Tradecraft. I mean, our sourcing director uh, is vice chair of the standards committee at Flow. And we need to have the ability to access and influence that so we can try and set new standards 
which still have the concerns of the small uh, at heart. And I think that's a, a profoundly Christian part of what we can, we can bring to the game. And I think on that point, um, a couple of years ago, there was some tradecraft films, and it very much focused on particular groups. And we showed one of those films in our church, and I sold the whole lot of tea from that particular area. Because I think what we can do very well as churches is we can link up with people. And when we recognise the link between what we're purchasing and that particular community, um, that's where a company like uh, Tradecraft can help, where Sainsbury's can't help, because it simply can't... Um... And I think the challenge to us to improve the quality of our communications and our messaging and the resources we provide in churches to get this sort of differentiated message across. And I don't think we've done that effectively enough because it's, it's not as well understood. Uh, I think our core supporters probably understand it, but whether the average person in the pews does, I, I rather doubt. So that is Right. Shall we try and fit in another couple of quick questions before we have to wind up? It's very difficult to set a, a fixed percentage because different products have different levels of intervention. A craft product is quite different. It comes as a finished good. So actually there, you would want to have a limit on, on the level of markup. And we, we would say we would want at least 20% of the selling price to be what's actually going to the producer's hands as our rule of thumb. On a food product, it's much more difficult because it's an ingredient and there's lots of manufacturing and other processes that go on as well. And a different type of food product will require different levels of investment. So you can't set a straight, a straight percentage. So all we can do is uh, try, try and make sure that, that a minimum fair price, hence the fair price uh, arguments, is paid. The problem with the fair price is how do you calculate that effectively? And there's a bit of a gap opening up, I think, between... Uh, people advocating a living wage, which is often actually set at an extremely high level compared to minimum wages, um, and is that affordable and, and can that be paid, or will it actually squeeze some of the small producers completely out of the market again? Because Nestle should be able to afford, with its margins, to pay living wages on its estates. A small coffee producer might not be able to, and then they would be disabled from selling on fair trade terms, and only the big players could do so. So there are some quite difficult quandaries there, because the living wage, in theory, has got to be a good thing to aspire for and build into your thinking. But if applied too quickly and, and uh, too bluntly, it could actually have a, uh, a contrary effect on, on the really poor. I, I'm not sure I can answer it briefly. I mean, I do think we've got to go further than just labelled fair trade. That, you know, that is not going to solve the problems of global poverty in itself. So I think that's why Tradecraft invests a lot of resource in wider campaigning on corporate accountability, on corporate purchasing practices in arenas that have nothing to do with fair trade as such. We believe that we need to be changing the way the current system works. Yes, in theory, you could completely change the system. And I'm saying you know, maybe we need to be arguing more for that. But that is a very long term goal. In the short term, though, we can begin to change and influence uh, mainstream practices. But, but fair trade should be a starting point, not the end, the end goal. Yes, and I think that's, but I think it's got to be clear, it's Tradecraft that's doing that as part of our wider mission. The Fair Trade Foundation has got a much more limited brief from fair trade Sort of finds itself in a catch-22 position, really. If you want Tesco's to be a licensee, you can't campaign against supermarket practices. We campaign avidly against supermarket practices and take the risk we won't sell our products, but it's much more difficult for, for the foundation to do that. Uh, and again, that's why a trade craft in our sort of organisation does have a, a unique um, opportunity to, to really do things and take fair trade further and, and go beyond fair trade. And increasingly in our thinking now, we're, we're, we're talking about being beyond fair trade and it's about justice and trade rather than just fair trade. And uh, uh, it's, it's not to, to say we don't want more fair trade to happen, but it's not enough. OK, we're, we're going to have to wind it up there. I'll thank Paul very much for an extremely interesting talk. But we are going to stay. Uh, we have some refreshments and we've been provided with some fair trade wine by... La Ria Jana, and I apologise if that's not how you say it, but um, some lovely wine. So please do stay and join us and talk with Paul some more. Um, I've also been asked to mention another um, uh, talk that's coming up, and we've got some information about it outside. Uh, but we have some nut farmers coming over from Malawi.
and there's an opportunity to hear their story and in a way that Paul was saying that making these connections and helping the smaller groups um, in ways that the, the big supermarkets can't help. This is a, an opportunity that you can actually get to speak to a couple of them. And this is on Thursday the 8th of March. And I can't remember where it is, but it's um, in London. And we'll leave that on the side. <laughs> I can't think where it is. It's provided by the City of London Fair Trade. Oh, the offices of Eversheds. I do apologise. Um, but it's, it's an opportunity to meet people. And I've met a few um, producers and there's nothing like hearing the story of the actual producer and being able to talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis so thank you very much Paul and I'm sure we'd like to show our appreciation once more